carefully saturate the strip of mat you intend to lay on the flange. We don't particularly care about the weight of the mold and are fairly generous with the resin content. But one cut edge up against the plug and the other falls evenly and minimizes the trimming necessary when finishing the flange. Watch for clear air bubbles in the resin and work them out using the brush and your fingers as you work. If you wish, paint some resin down on the flange before you lay your mat strip into place. We also cut a number of strips of mat about 8 inches wide. These I tore in half, which left two strips with a single cut edge and one frayed edge. I placed the frayed edge strips onto the plug surface by butting the cut edge into the corner against the flange. The frayed edge drapes evenly onto the plug surface where the other layers may be applied over it without trapping air pockets. This butt joint at the corners effectively eliminates air bubbles. As always, I applied these strips one layer at a time, watching closely not to trap air. After a few layers have been applied in this way, I place the cut edge of the strip even with the edge of the flange and allow the frayed edge to overlap onto the plug. After the flange and plug corner were covered with one even layer, we were ready to lay up the surface over the plug. It is easier to work torn chunks over the contours than full lengths of mat. You will again lay resin on the surface and saturate the mat as well. Applying the mat directly with gloved hands is the most common approach and allows for the feel of the plug. Stippling with a brush and a groove saturation roller help to eliminate air. You will want to apply a total of two mat layers to the plug and the flange before continuing with the 10 ounce fabric. Another secret too is you don't have to work on the stuff all the time. If you get enough resin on it, okay, and you leave it sitting evenly along the top, uh -huh. in time it'll soak in. Like you could go to the next piece a little bit, you know? That's not what you do toward the end when the resin is hardening. But you can just kind of let it sit. And in time, just by itself, it'll soak in a little bit for you. You need to let each of these first two mat layers cure individually before laying up the first layer of 10 ounce fabric. This ensures that the mold does not get too hot and distort the tooling gel coat during the cure cycle. Once these three layers have been applied in this fashion and the mold allowed to cool, two to three layers may be applied at a time and the mold will resist heat distortion. Continue by laying in the 10 ounce fabric between every two layers of chop strand mat. The fabric is stronger and more stable than the mat and will help the overall strength of the mold. You don't want to cut the 10 ounce fabric more than necessary. It will be necessary to cut slits and some contours, but you don't want to cut strips. The properties of the fabric are best achieved by leaving it in as big of pieces as possible. You can still apply resin liberally as needed to the plug and to the layers of reinforcement. Try to work evenly, applying the same number of layers to all areas. On large molds, it is easy to lose track of how many layers have been applied and where. If you leave a surface cure for more than 24 hours, it may be necessary to sand it prior to laying on additional layers. After all of the reinforcement layers were applied, the completed mold half was about 5 eighths of an inch thick. We usually recommend that the mold be three to four times thicker than the parts to be produced in them. This is easily the case with the top mold as only three layers of carbon fiber will be used to make the upper shell. The lower mold is also plenty thick because the sandwich laminate is really only seven layers of carbon fiber. All seven are only an eighth of an inch thick in areas with no honeycomb. A better gauge is to determine how long the mold is to be in service. If it is expected to be used often, make it a little heavier now so it will last. The fourth step of molding is releasing the mold from the plug. Releasing the molds from the plug can often be a tedious process. Locate the largest gaps between the two molds and begin working the wedges into these locations. Choose a wedge which matches the gap as they come in multiple sizes. The first few wedges are generally the most difficult to insert. Once a few are in place, creating more gaps, Larger wedges may be worked around the mold until it releases completely. Never use any metal objects to aid in the release of the mold. Invariably, metal will gouge or crack the new mold. In this case, it was just a matter of inserting enough wedges around the perimeter until the mold broke free. The rear came up first, then the rest of the mold was lifted off the plug. The plug is still resting in the lower mold, but it obviously came through the molding process intact. It took many hands to lift the large, waxed plug out of the lower mold. 
However, the two came apart easily because they had been released once before. We inspected the molds following their release. Both were found to have highly polished surface finishes. There were no marks or scratches requiring coarse sanding to eliminate, but a slight surface texture was present. The top mold looked great and the team was feeling excited. Overall, I was extremely pleased and felt that we were well on our way to making the shell. Off camera, Scott used an air power die grinder just as before to trim the excess material from the flange of the top mold. After that, he wet sanded beginning with 320 grit while using foam sanding pads. It quickly progressed to 600 grit. The mold was then washed and dried. Machine glaze was spread on the surface and hand polished using terry wipes. The molds were then waxed six times, again allowing an hour between every two coats. At this stage, both the upper and lower molds were perfectly polished and ready for use in vacuum bagging fabrication. The plug construction portion of this project took longer to complete than necessary. In the end, two perfect molds were produced, but they could have been done sooner and easier with more forethought at the design stage. I was eager to get building and left some quality issues in the cross-section designs unaddressed. I knew I could compensate for it later, so I forged ahead. It's a testimony to the composite materials themselves that such fine products can be made from such humble beginnings. Take it from me, it is better to spend an extra week at the drafting table or computer than an extra month in the shop. Remember the phrase, measure twice, cut once. Following the molding portion of this project, the student team from the University of Akron had a working knowledge of the plug concept and mold making techniques necessary for completion of a project on this scale. It was encouraging to hear the comments of the students as they brainstormed about other projects they could tackle using these skills and materials. It is our goal that this video has given you the same knowledge and confidence to tackle your molding projects, even if the design exists only in your mind. Using easily formed materials, you can follow this process step by step to construct your desired plug and the molds to make your parts. Consult either the sister video on sandwich core construction or our molding fiberglass video for instructions on lamination of finished parts. The last three steps of molding involve preparing the mold for fabrication through releasing the final parts. These steps are covered in both our molding fiberglass and our sister video vacuum bagging techniques and sandwich core construction. Remember that you can call and talk to Scott or any member of our customer service team and we will be glad to help you with your questions and your project. We want your project to be a success. Thank you for watching.